Welcome to Pathology Central Race in Medicine. Today's topic is cystic fibrosis. So why are we talking about cystic fibrosis when we're talking about race in medicine? Well, as many of you know, there's a strong correlation between cystic fibrosis and European ancestry, as you can see from this quote here from Robin's Basic Pathology 10th edition, in which uh, we are looking at the carrier frequency of cystic fibrosis in a variety of American populations, including Caucasians, African Americans, Asians, and Hispanics. Let's pause for a public service announcement here about the term Caucasians. So as scientists and physicians, let's take this term and throw it away. It will not be in the 11th edition of Robin's Basic Pathology. So this term uh, is really just a euphemism to say white, and it sounds more scientific than saying white people, so it's seen everywhere in the scientific literature. I would direct you uh, to this uh, website, which is what took me to this article where this quote comes from. Because Caucasian actually refers to the Caucasus region of Central Europe, uh, and populations originating in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh all are considered Caucasian. Now that's not what we mean when we read a scientific uh, article that refers to a particular disease incidence in Caucasians, right? So as this uh, article says, except as an erroneous euphemism for referring to persons of European descent, the word has little value in race, ethnicity, and health research. So in other words, this word has little value in race, ethnicity, and health research. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. So uh, this first uh, quotation was looking at carrier frequency. Uh, Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive uh, disease, uh, so you need to have two alleles affected before you get a phenotype. Uh, This uh, quotation from up to date Uh, is looking at the prevalence of the actual disease. Uh, And so you can see here, they have it listed according to a variety uh, of American populations. I'll go over this in a little bit more detail uh, later. Uh, It also mentions that we're recognizing cystic fibrosis in areas that were not traditionally associated with cystic fibrosis, such as South and East Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And part of that is because we weren't looking for it. And if you don't look for it there, you don't tend to find it. A final comment I would make about this quotation uh, is referring to the, uh, the increasing um, uh, prevalence that we will notice uh, due to increased uh, newborn screening. Well, it depends on which alleles we're looking for because they are population dependent, and this is important. So what is cystic fibrosis? As I already mentioned, it is an autosomal recessive disease. And what happens is you have a defect in ion transport, which leads to abnormally viscid mucus secretions. All of these uh, various systems can be affected, uh, but clinically it is the blockage of airways and pancreatic ducts, which has uh, a great uh, Im- uh, impact on patients because it can lead to chronic pulmonary infections and pancreatic insufficiency. The way this works is if you have the wild type uh, cystic uh, fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, Uh, here in the sweat duct. What it does in the sweat duct is it's going to encourage uh, chloride to come into the cell and it is going to uh, support the activity of the epithelial sodium channel, so bringing ions in. When we've knocked out CFTR, as we see here in cystic fibrosis, chloride cannot enter the cell and we're not supporting the epithelial sodium channel. So you end up with hypertonic salty sweat, which is what is associated with infants with cystic fibrosis. By contrast, uh, what we see in the respiratory epithelium is that the role of CFTR is to encourage chloride to leave the cell to the, uh, to the airway and to inhibit uh, the epithelial sodium channel from bringing sodium uh, into the cell. Since you have uh, relatively uh, few ions here, you're going to get a small amount of water coming in through osmosis. Most of it is going to stay here in the mucus, so it'll be nice and loosey-goosey, and the cilia can beat freely, getting particulate matter out of the lungs. But if you knock out your CFTR, you're no longer able to transport chloride out into the uh, airway, and without the inhibition on the epithelial sodium channel, sodium is also coming into the cell. Both of these are going to cause uh, osmotic pressure to bring water in, which will dehydrate the mucus. You can see here the cilia are no longer happily beating, but are are sad. Uh, And we have a setup here with this dehydrated gunky mucus for uh, recurrent pulmonary infections. Now, in 1989, the CFTR gene was identified, and since then, uh, we've found more than 2,000 mutations uh, in this gene. 
Now, this is problematic from a screening perspective uh, because unlike something like sickle cell, where there's one mutation which makes it relatively easy to look for, we see here in CFTR that uh, only about 20 have a global prevalence of greater than 0.1%. And uh, only five have a global prevalence of greater than 1%. Now, not all of these mutations are created equally. They have different effects. Uh, the, uh, here are the different classes of mutations. Uh, the first three are the most severe. And the one that we'll be focusing on a bit uh, will be delta F508, or deletion of phenylalanine at position 508. All right, so let's talk about delta F508 and why it's so important when we think about cystic fibrosis. So delta F508 uh, is about 70% of mutated alleles globally, and that's because so many Europeans have this allele. So on average, about 73% of Northern and Western Europeans who have cystic fibrosis carry this allele. Now, because of our European ancestry in the United States, about 90% of American cystic fibrosis patients have at least one of these uh, alleles, one of the delta F508 mutations. And, you know, not Surprisingly, about 94% of American cystic fibrosis patients are of European descent. So we can see that all these numbers sort of are moving together. Now, I really like uh, this uh, particular uh, map, which looks at uh, the prevalence of Delta F508 uh, in Europe. And you can see here, uh, for example, and this is looking at uh, individuals with cystic fibrosis, that about 88% of uh, patients in Denmark with cystic fibrosis have the Delta F508. Uh, we also see um, a high incidence in uh, Germany, uh, in England, Ireland, somewhat lower uh, here in um, uh, southern, uh, southern and Mediterranean Europe. I'm going to point out uh, Portugal and Spain uh, because when we talk about uh, Hispanic ancestry, uh, that will become more relevant. So why is Delta F508 so prevalent? So there's some very interesting work that was done uh, by uh, Dr. Farrell, uh, who, uh, has, uh, who suggests that this mutation arose uh, in the early Bronze Age in southwestern Europe. Uh, he believes it began really in Portugal and France and moved rapidly from there uh, onto uh, Britain and Ireland, uh, arriving in uh, southeastern Europe only about 1,000 years ago. Now, how did it travel so quickly? Uh, one belief is, is that uh, it originated in a, in a group of people uh, known as the Bell Beaker uh, people. Uh, and this uh, is showing areas where artifacts from the Bell Beaker uh, people are found. Uh, this was a trade and immigration route. Uh, and so if it originated here, then there was rapid transmittal across Europe, not so much uh, here to the Mediterranean or Southeastern Europe. So, but why is it so prevalent? Uh, so people have suggested that it might have some sort of survival advantage. Uh, people have considered typhoid fever and cholera. We know that for a disease like cystic fibrosis, which is uh, very uh, deadly, has a high mortality in the uh, homozygous uh, state, that perhaps there may be some sort of heterozygote advantage. And the corollary to this would be sickle cell disease, where being homozygous for hemoglobin S uh, comes with significant uh, challenges, but being a heterozygote confers survival advantage uh, in the context of malaria. So we don't actually know what this pathogen could be, uh, there, I've talked with a number of um, really incredible evolutionary biologists, including Dr. Joe Graves Jr. Uh, and Dr. Marty Kreitman. Nobody knows uh, what this could be. Perhaps as a permafrost uh, continues to melt from global warming, a pathogen will be released and we will see uh, that Delta F508 heterozygotes do have a, uh, a survival advantage. So stay tuned. Okay, so we talked a little bit about uh, cystic fibrosis in Europeans. Let's look at how this translates to the United States. So this is bringing up once more the up-to-date uh, data, and then this is looking at the United States uh, Cystic Fibrosis uh, Registry. Uh, and we can see that we see it predominantly in white Americans. Uh, we also see, uh, but the one thing to keep in mind is that it's not non-existent in other populations. Uh, and so and this is an actual uh, CF patients in the United States. We see about 94% of them are white uh, compared to uh, Hispanics, African Americans, and other races. So as we think about this, let's look at the mutations in these various populations. So we know that Delta F508 is associated with European descent, uh, which we see in the United States. We also see Delta F508 here 
in individuals of African descent, about 29%, as well as Hispanic. Uh, as well as here are just listed a, a couple of other mutations that are seen in these populations. Now, uh, we're only beginning to start doing research uh, in actual Africa uh, and in Asia, and we're finding that the, um, the Delta F508 is not common in those populations. And in fact, in uh, the Chinese set that was looked at, there were 25 unique mutations, and only one of them was in the recommended screening panel. So we'll talk more about the recommended screening panel in a moment. So why do we have this Delta F508 uh, in African descent and Hispanic descent? Probably primarily due to population admixture. So I'm going to take you to some very interesting uh, data looking at ancestry informative markers. Uh, this is a study by Brick and colleagues looking at uh, information from 23andMe. And what you can see is, is that the uh, mean African uh, ancestry and the mean European ancestry vary depending on the region where you are. And in fact, there are some parts of the country like West Virginia and Washington where more than 30% of the um, genetic contribution is actually uh, from Europe. So perhaps that accounts for the Delta F508. Similarly, uh, for Hispanic individuals, we know that uh, in the Latino population, uh, about 65 to 85% of that genetic contribution is European. Now, this brings me back to that earlier image I showed you of the uh, low prevalence of Delta F508 in Portugal and Spain. So I'm not sure how this really comes across in this, but I just, uh, it is a, a somewhat um, uh, admixture issue. All right, so how does this all become clinically relevant? Well, let's talk about newborn screening. So it became aware, it became apparent to people that it was important to recognize cystic fibrosis early because then you were able to give people the appropriate treatment and improve their health and their survival. So starting in 2010, we had newborn screening for cystic fibrosis in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And this meant that the average age of diagnosis was about two to four weeks. Now, the way newborn screening is done for cystic fibrosis is on a dried blood spot, looking for uh, an increase in immunoreactive trypsinogen. And if it is elevated, which you see in individuals with cystic fibrosis, secondary testing uh, occurs, either simply a repeat of the IRT or DNA testing using a panel of common mutations or both. If you have two positive IRT or an identified CFTR variant, then you use a sweat chloride test to confirm cystic fibrosis. So what is important here is that if you're doing DNA testing, the variance in the panel would determine how specific and sensitive your test is. So how does newborn screening underserve non-Europeans, part one? So uh, this is a study from 2014 uh, that looked at uh, individuals who are being screened uh, for cystic fibrosis, looking at carrier frequency. Uh, and this was, uh, these were simply tests being sent to a reference lab, so it was not a research protocol. So uh, most, the vast majority of individuals were being uh, submitted for the 32 variant panel, a smaller number for the 69 variant. And there was not uh, overlap between uh, these two panels or these two populations. And you can see that looking at the 32 variant panel, you have lower numbers uh, of uh, white Americans, African Americans, and Hispanics uh, than you see uh, with the uh, 69 variant panel. So uh, doing the mathematics, uh, the researchers showed that you were identifying about 21% more carriers in African Americans and about 32% more carriers in Hispanics. So we're not picking them up with the standard 32 variant panel. How does newborn screening underserve non-Europeans part two? So this is actually a combination from two studies uh, with overlap between the researchers. What they did was they identified uh, mutations in 140 cystic fibrosis patients who self-identified as Black, Asian, uh, Native American, East Indian, uh, or Middle Eastern. Uh, so they went through and they found out what exactly the mutations were, and they integrated that, um, those data with genotype data from the Cystic uh, Fibrosis Foundation Patient Registry to estimate allele frequencies. In the next paper, they compared three common cystic fibrosis panels that looked at 23 to 41 variants to determine the impact on non-white patients. And this is uh, what their data showed, uh, the percentage of non-white patients who would be missed uh, using the commonly used uh, panels. So you can see it ranges from 7% of Native Americans uh, to 28% of Asians are going to be missed. So finally, how does newborn screening underserve non-Europeans part three? 
Uh, this is from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists uh, from their uh, statement on uh, recommendations for screening. Uh, and they point out here, this is once more looking at carrier testing. Uh, if you look at this based on uh, socially defined race or ethnic group, you can see that depending on which group you're in, um, you may not, uh, so fewer than 50% of Asian Americans uh, will be identified using the recommended panel. So what is all this telling us? This is telling us not that we need to, you know, do 3,000 uh, allele panels. Well, since there are only 2,000 mutations, that probably wouldn't be useful anyway. So we don't need to do 1,000 allele panels to pick up every variant, right? Uh, that would be cost prohibitive and might not be tremendously useful because we know that cystic fibrosis is lower in these other populations. Though to some extent, we don't know how low because we haven't been looking for it and because the phenotype can vary. But what this should tell you as a clinician is that if you have a patient who is presenting with multiple pulmonary infections uh, as, you know, as a child, that you should consider this and take race out of the question. Don't look at socially defined race. Just look at that child as if they have no race at all and say, could this disease, could cystic fibrosis be an issue? And why is this important? Right? So here's an example where race was included all along. This comes from uh, an excellent paper, The Misuse of Race in Medical Diagnosis, in which the author recounts the story of a childhood friend who wasn't diagnosed with cystic fibrosis until she was eight years old. Right? She's African American. Uh, she presented multiple times with suspicious uh, symptoms, but was only identified and diagnosed when a clinician who could not see the color of her skin, literally couldn't see it, saw the chest radiograph and said, who's the kid with cystic fibrosis? Uh, because the phenotype varies, uh, we have here an example uh, from the more recent literature uh, from 2021 of a 54-year-old African-American man who, who was finally diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And this is an article from uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association tackling the misconception that cystic fibrosis is a white people's disease, right? Because we are causing harm if we do not diagnose uh, these patients. So cystic fibrosis survival depends on early diagnosis and appropriate treatment. So Canada is leading the pack with a median survival of nearly 50 years. Uh, they have an excellent screening program and they have cystic fibrosis uh, centers to, to treat uh, their patients. Europe and US doing it about 40, uh, 40 years. Uh, median survival in Africa is quite low, about 20.5 years. Uh, and in part, this is because uh, people aren't picking up the diagnosis early. Uh, the first uh, diagnosis of uh, cystic fibrosis uh, in Africa was only in the 1950s. Uh, in part, this is because the symptoms overlap uh, with uh, protein uh, malnourishment. Uh, with, um, and so when you have undernourished children, they also have failure to thrive, which is the classic presentation of cystic fibrosis. So it could be that the incidence is much higher and is not being picked up. Looking at the era of newborn screening, once more we're thinking about which alleles are we looking for? Are we picking up everybody? Who are we missing? So uh, in this particular study, they considered a light, uh, a, a, an on-time diagnosis to be six weeks, and a late diagnosis was about a year and six weeks, so a year later. And they found even with just a one-year difference, these children had more hospitalizations, worse lung function, and higher rates of chronic colonization by pseudomonas, right? So, so more challenges with their health. So it's absolutely critical that we identify patients and we take care of them. So, so be aware of this, um, that the tests, the screening tests are not optimal in non-Ashkenazi Jewish, uh, non-European descent individuals. Here's my extensive list uh, of references. Uh, and I'm going to finish with um, a cartoon from a brilliant cardiology fellow at the University of Chicago, uh, Dr. Charlene Obuobi. Uh, you can go to her website. Uh, shirleyworldmd.com for her trenchant uh, comics uh, as well as her incisive commentary on race and medicine. And here she's uh, looking at the difference in a um, societal response to individuals with cystic fibrosis uh, and those with sickle cell disease. Uh, I will let her words uh, speak to this. You can hit pause and read the cartoon. But I will finish uh, by bringing in some uh, more objective data uh, that looks at uh, federal and foundation funding for sickle cell uh, and cystic fibrosis. Uh, so uh, the population affected by cystic fibrosis in the United States is about 35,000 compared to about 100,000 U.S. Uh, patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, 
And you can see that federal funding uh, is significantly higher for patients with sickle cell. It's about, I'm sorry, with cystic fibrosis, about fourfold. And if you look at foundation funding, it's even more extreme. Uh, and to me, this is because this represents a snapshot uh, of, um, of systemic racism. So if you have a family member uh, who has one of these two diseases and you come from a European uh, background, you have perhaps more generational wealth, uh, you're able to contribute more freely uh, to this disease that has claimed a loved one. If, however, you are of African descent and you lack the uh, generational wealth because of systemic racism in this country, even if you wish to donate uh, as much money as you can, perhaps you cannot. Now, we know that money alone uh, doesn't cause a cure, right? So we've been pouring money into the, the war on cancer uh, without coming up with cures for the vast majority of patients. Um, it does appear uh, we do have more research articles uh, coming out here. Uh, once more, um, you know, some contribution from money. So anyway, I hope this has been useful uh, in looking at cystic cell, uh, sorry, looking at cystic fibrosis in the context of race and medicine. Thank you very much for your time.